Um, good morning and welcome on this very cold January morning. Thanks so much for coming. Um, the presentation is titled Creating and Sustaining an Effective Non-Academic Assessment Culture. Um, I didn't add the word culture, but that's essentially the, the gist of the presentation. It's really geared towards our non-academic units because as you all know, and I see quite a few faculty here, there are many of you that I've worked with very closely over the past uh, year that I've been here in terms of shaping up and ensuring that all the academic assessment plans are up to date and um, done in a fashion that is promoting uh, sustainability and of course the flourishment of each of your programs. So what we are doing today is presenting specifically on the non-academic units because that is one, one area of our current um, institutional need that was identified by middle states at, it, at its most recent review and reaffirmation. So what we will be doing is going over the non-academic assessment, what it is, why we're doing it, um, how to improve it better, and also how to ensure that we are on par with closing the loop for our 2021-22 upcoming review. Yes, folks, it's only uh, a couple of years away, and uh, this will be an all-hands-on-deck initiative, as you're probably aware, when middle states uh, reporting comes due, we engage the entire campus to promote the, the cross-communication efforts and ensure that we are all on the same page in terms of what the institutional mission and goals are so that we can all contribute and be um, rewarded in the end we, with a reaffirmation of accreditation. So again, welcome. Um, if you need to stop me for questions, just raise your hand. I'll confess I don't have my glasses on, so you may need to shout. <laughs> But whether or not you would prefer to have questions at the very end or during the presentation, it's entirely up to you. So if you feel like there's something that you need me to pause for, go ahead and stop me. So just shout. Um, session agenda. So we'll introduce the staff of my office. We'll go over the most recent Middle States PRR report update. Why do we assess the goals and the benefits of the non-academic assessment? the University Assessment System Overview. Those of you who are very familiar with the academic cycle, there is one that essentially mimics um, the academic cycle on the administrative side. So, so they do run parallel because we, as, as well as every institution in the nation, feel that it's essential that those two very important facets of the university uh, work together because we have common goals, common, uh, common directives that we need to fulfill um, to adhere to the strategic plan as well as the institutional mission as a whole. Uh, we're going to go over, for those of you that are new to assessment, how to define the unit objectives, how to define unit measures so that they are indeed effective and yield results that you can use at the very end stage of when you are writing your report. So there are a number of ways to target that um, so that you are not, in June, finding yourself with uh, objectives that are non-measurable and goals that are unattainable, really of no fault of your own, but simply because perhaps you're quite new to this exercise and um, are unfamiliar. Um, we're going to look at how to look at data and close the loop, and then, of course, ask for your feedback. Do you think I could have just a show of hands of how many faculty versus how many administrators are in the room? So faculty? Okay, <laughs> so this will be a very much a repeat of everything that you already know, but basically on the administrative side. This is probably a very good um, exercise for you all because then you'll understand that it's not only you that is assessing continuously throughout the academic year, through your efforts with, with your curriculum, with your ongoing class assessments, um, and of course, uh, I understand it firsthand because I've worked uh, at a number of schools and, and I know this is a big task, but please be reminded that this entire exercise is evident on the non-academic side of the house as well. So it's not only you that's being questioned by my office quite frequently, it's also the other side and there's quite a few units. And then how many administrators? Okay, so we kind of have an even amount. That's good, that's good. All right, excellent. So if you want to say anything as we begin, does anyone have any thoughts for food for thought that I need to cover that you don't see on the agenda that you want to bravely volunteer at um, 
9.14 in the morning. <laughs> it's very early for those folks. Nothing? Okay, so we'll proceed. Who makes up my office? So myself, um, like I said, my name is Carolina Wolf. Uh, Dr. Archaria, who is the Associate Director. Mukul is tasked primarily with database and, um, uh, and, and data management. So this is a very niche function in my office. I, uh, you know, when you look at the overall layout of, of, a, of a very effective office, you want to make sure that the needs of the institution um, that I clearly discovered over the past year that I was here are, are well covered and not just sort of distributed amongst the individuals in the office, which as you can see is quite well staffed. You know, all, all two of us are um, quite busy. So Mukul is really mining shop in all of the academic and non-academic databases, and he is instrumental in analyzing the data that I perhaps uh, find myself a little shorthanded with during the day-to-day -day operations. We run quite a few surveys, we look at quite a bit of data, and, and that analysis is essential, as you probably know, to closing the loop. And I also have Ms. Roseanne McKenney, who's been a staple at this institution for a very, very long time, initially in the office of the provost, and then some other departments, and now I'm lucky enough to have Roseanne to help me with not only institutional knowledge of the individuals, but also um, the knowledge of processes and procedures, which, of course, I'm completely unaware of, so, so she's been quite instrumental in that. So folks, brief overview of the PRR report. As you know, an institution, a, in a degree granting institution like us has a certain set of requirements that we must meet to our regional accreditor, which is the Middle States Commission of Higher Education. We are uh, definitely under the scope just like every other institution, so this becomes a guiding body of processes and procedures for us, which I find to be quite informative um, and, and a way to keep us in check so that we don't deviate from anything that we and, and find ourselves in a predicament that we don't want to find ourselves in in terms of perhaps not meeting a certain standards that they have clearly outlined. Middle States is very helpful and we've established quite a good of a relationship with them uh, myself, the Office of the Provost, and especially in the last um, year and a half, I would say we've had an active communication um, and have uh, received quite a bit of guidance with all of the new changes. And I myself have worked with Middle States for about 13 years now and uh, have been on a number of boards for them. Um, so, you know, it, it is a good uh, strategy to ensure that, like I said, any new uh, items that may be coming up, such as the annual institutional profile that has replaced the former profile that we used to submit that is much more comprehensive and actually serves as an excellent institutional data gathering tool. So what we, are have, what we have done annually is provided a what we call an IP, institutional profile, which was very, uh, very top level overview of the programs that we offer, the governing body of the institution, some of our enrollment, which is uh, derived from the federal reporting to iPads, uh, and uh, you know that used to be okay for middle states. But what what middle states had noticed is that institutions were reporting this. However, there was not a very systemic cycle of self-assessment that had gone on throughout the year that forced us to re-examine our goals and outcomes, which all faculty are familiar with, because that is the standard that you're held accountable for for your students and their success and their retention which as you all know is a high level initiative of the board, of the president, of the provost, and all the offices on campus. So they developed um, the annual institutional profile, which now looks at goals and objectives and outcomes. And this is a self-reporting mechanism. However, we have, um, we have indicated that we will be reporting our goals and outcomes every year. So beginning with the next year's collection cycle, this year was somewhat of a beta test because this was the first year that this was implemented. We will begin to uh, showcase our achievements. This is why the non-academic unit assessment is so important because I can certainly go back and draw on so many initiatives that I have seen throughout all of the programs that are academic on campus. That gets somewhat lost, I'll be very honest with you, in the non-academic units, which are doing just as much work and accomplishing so much, but have not found a way to funnel that and communicate those achievements through a single source and then of course have that be reported out so that we can be proud of it. You know, it becomes very easy when you're an accredited program 
to be very proud and have a, a regimented system in place. When you're a unit that services so many different areas, such as the register, I mean, they touch so much. How do you go, uh, go about identifying very specific goals every year? Remember, these folks are not on a program review cycle like the academic units regi in, a, in a regimented fashion. I'll get to that in a little bit. Although they have that in place, it has not been something that was done religiously. Academic units do that every three to five years because they are required to do so, some by accreditation and some for institutional improvement um, of their programming. So what, we, what had occurred was, Middle States, of course, we submitted our uh, periodic review report. They reviewed it and, and gave us a directive that they would like us to provide further evidence to support our assessment of the effectiveness of general education, providing student learning opportunities. This is standard three. This is something that is already, the efforts are already on the way. We're just trying to figure out how to best synthesize the data and re-examine the GE curriculum if there is a need to do so. And then number two, which is why this presentation is occurring, is the institutional and unit level goals that are clearly stated, assessed appropriately, linked to mission and goal achievement, and that reflect conclusions drawn from assessment results. So what we are looking for is not just the story that you are doing the work that you are promising to do, but rather closing the loop that, that we have committed to X, Y, and Z, we have we have measured it in this fashion, and then these are the, the results that have now occurred as part of that self-reflection, and this is the fiscal impact, as well as the impact on the institution as a whole, perhaps on some of the, uh, perhaps on the reorganization, and I'm not saying that that's the case here. I'm simply drawing from past experience. So this is really a, a, a way to commit us to a more regimented review cycle of our administrative units, they're not saying that we're not doing it. They're just simply saying that we need to provide a better, um, a, a better standard and a, and a more cohesive work environment in which we collect this, which we work on this. And then, of course, the last uh, part of that, and I see Dr. Busquet sitting here, who is the chair of the University Planning Council. This is a vital step in providing her the necessary information that she needs in order to begin efforts on new, uh, constructing the new strategic plan as well as closing the loop on the old strategic plan. So just like you owe data to your deans, the units on the administrative side owe data, and, and of course this particular report that I'll share with you via the template to my office, then to Dr. Busquet, and then she diligently with, with uh, Mr. Austin uh, puts that together in a way that is reflective of whether or not we meet the strategic goals, where do we need to improve, um, and again, it's, it's an ongoing cycle, and without that, we cannot successfully move forward, and without that, it's quite difficult to um, construct a new strategic plan, to be quite honest with you, because we don't know, without having an inside view to every unit, where the needs are. So this is a vital step in, in, in constructing that path, and while many of the units have already embarked on that, I think not many know why we do it. So is it really just because I just want to collect three more pages of reports from you, or is it really for something that will be reflected upon, reported back, and it will garner the attention that it needs to provide a, uh, an establishment of new goals and objectives for the future. We have a next evaluation visit that, are, that will occur in the year 2021-22, like I mentioned initially, and this, will be a, uh, and this will be a very comprehensive visit. This will require us to have the data that I mentioned. This will require us to write a comprehensive report about the state of the institution, and it will uh, force us to really re-examine our current processes and procedures and policies, and whether, the, and I'm speaking strictly on the administrative side at the moment, and whether or not they are producing the outcomes that we have set forth to produce. Um, on the academic side, again, you folks are familiar with this, are we meeting the student learning outcomes that we have examined so diligently over the past um, you know, five years? or do we need to re-envision those uh, as part of the curricular review, as part of the program review discovery that you have conducted. So we are excited for the visit, but I do urge you to consider that everything that you're doing now will aid our efforts in combining your data, your findings, your summaries, and then producing that very vital report which will show our accreditor that we are indeed meeting the standards that they have set forth, which were recently revised 
uh, in order to continue and reaffirm our accreditation. I'm going to take a breather. Any questions? Oh, great. I see this is an exciting assessment <laughs> presentation so early. I'm sorry. Okay, I promise that I probably will not take the entire hour and a half. I might if you have questions, but um, I hope that this is beneficial to you in sort of presenting you with the other side of the house for the faculty and for the new um, newcomers, what our expectations are here internally. So what are the benefits of administrative assessment? Um, I'm not gonna read this, but you can all take a second to uh, uh, quickly read over. It essentially covers what I just spoke about. It provides us with coming up with outcomes, monitoring them, and then of course contributing to the overall report as well as the meeting the requirements of the middle states and, and internally without this we cannot self-assess and we cannot progress forward and, and look at those very strong initiatives very critical initiatives that the president has defined in his speech student retention student success i think i see Ms. lozada in the back and i can share with you that she and i have very closely started to narrow down our focus um, as to what we want to look at and how we want to define student success, retention, what groups, how do we go about that, whether it's only student-centered or is it also employee-centered, which is the HR side of the house um, on the administrative level. But you know, we have an academic uh, collaboration that is ongoing already, and I would say not a formalized administrative collaboration between OAA and, um, and human resources, but one that is um, functioning and will be formalized in, in the near future. We want to examine the type of retention efforts that we put forth with our faculty. We want to, and again, this is aside from what the provost office is doing, it's simply for research purposes for OAA. Um, so retention, student success come to the forefront of my mind when I talk about this, the, the faculty side. That, as it applies to human capital, the employees, and of course, our meeting of the strategic plan is what I think of when I look at the administrative side of the house. Okay, so why do we assess the administrative units? Well, we want to really reduce the redundancy. You may not know that your unit, which is comprised of five different areas, may very well be doing the same task five times, five different times, getting five different data results, and then it becomes a, a, a Q&A of how do you do this? Well, I, I, I don't agree with your numbers. I don't agree with your summary. Well, so what assessment does is brings all of the units together to look at the goals, not only as applicable to their individual unit, but also as they apply to the VP area as a whole. I can tell you there are two things that I, uh, I had done over the course of the last, um, couple of months, I had met with all of the VPs to um, begin a process of identifying the champions for each unit, the leaders in each unit, which will serve in a similar role of a um, academic program coordinator that we have on the academic side of the house. Because I was finding that it would, was very difficult for me to figure out who was responsible for reporting for HR for finance and uh, this way we set up a system of communication where I don't have to meet with all the uh, respective employees in a particular unit but rather I have one individual as my go-to person that knowledge is shared he or she can act on my behalf uh, with some guidance of course to craft the particular outcomes that, that we may decide upon we will converse and talk about how to improve um, current processes, so I, I'm working to identify them. I, I have just about everyone identified. So this will enable me to communicate with you directly, and it will be a very targeted and strategic communication effort so that the message is not getting lost in translation. I can tell you that I am very much at fault for not communicating in a more succinct fashion the fact that the initial part one of the assessment plan for the administrative units was due on January. Uh, I'm sorry, on December 30th. Um, for me, because I have been so used to the fact that the academic side is very regimented in delivering it in a very, very timely fashion, and it's ingrained in what they do every day, I didn't really think about the fact that I do need to be much more 
um, active in communicating. This is due, I need to meet with everybody. Um, I will improve that. That's really something that I need to work on. Uh, again, it's been a challenge for me as well, having come into this position and figuring out and prioritizing which side of the house, and my house meaning OAA, do I need to work on first in order to meet the most critical need? And that really focused on accreditation and assessment that was academic. So that is in great shape. We're moving now into the administrative units and we will begin to have a strategic approach to that just like I, I have had with all of the academic units on campus. Um, another goal of administrative assessment is articulating and linking the needs as defined by middle states and our strategic plan. Have all of you read our strategic plan? Folks, be honest. I mean, I, I, it's very lengthy, and uh, as all strategic plans are, but it's very vital for you to familiarize yourself with that, whether you're a uh, faculty member or, a, uh, or an administrative employee, because I think it will make a very clear path for how you will view your unit. And of course, the direction that the vice president had set forth for you to um, uh, undertake in order to uh, engage in the goals that they have put forth. And I can assure you that their goals are definitely aligned with the strategic plan. So it, it's a very interesting um, read. It will prepare you for writing your report, but it will also probably spark a number of questions that you may have because the goals in the strategic plan are not explicitly stated to relate to your unit. So many questions that I have received have been, well, Carolina, um, I don't know how my unit applies to X, Y, and Z. Well, how does finance contribute to student retention and student success? I mean, it's a, probably not the best example, but, but one that I can think of at the top of my head, you know, uh, that, that question was asked. And it was not asked by the staff, but at a prior institution. And of course, my, my response is, well, you have a number of deliverables that you request of the students, and we need to make sure that on our end, we deliver a response and we close the loop. So if a student is, um, if a student is on a financial hold and you have not resolved that in an adequate amount of time, they will leave because they will complain, they will complain again. And again, remember the type of students that we service here, ones that I'm very much um, you know, passionate about, they, they may not have the resources that we all do in terms of understanding what does that mean and how does that impact their future and their education moving forward. An unsettled bill puts a hold, they can't, they can't register, they can't move forward in their education and they're likely to get disheartened and leave. And it will take us three more, three times as much effort to recruit a new student and retain them as it does to lose that one student through a simple communication strategy. So one area that, that might have been tackled by this particular individual would be to examine the communication strategy and the turnaround town uh, and, and the turnaround time of how they address student concerns. Are there uh, concerns that take priority? Is there a need to really construct a, a scale of what is really important to be answered within a day versus what is somewhat important and it, rec and it can be answered within three days? Are there concerns that need to be addressed with multiple offices and do we have a strategy that enables us to be the single source answer as opposed to having the student bounce from one area to another, again, not making it very uh, enticing to stay if they feel like they're not getting any help. Think about yourselves when you are logging into a platform of any sort or you're shopping online and you have, and it generally stats have shown that three clicks is the amount of time that a person becomes discouraged and leaves a particular site, area, or whatnot. So it's that three-click mentality. If I cannot accomplish what I need to accomplish within three clicks or three attempts, I lose that audience. Generate new cross-departmental analysis. Again, this goes back to that, that same uh, notion of this particular individual asking me that question. Yes? Yes. Okay, so the, qu the, the statement more of a question was, if a student calls and no one is available in the office, they will by default contact what they know 
is the college of, of, of that they are per, uh, at the moment attached to and perhaps there's the one available at the college to answer their question and the student then bounces back to the office see this is the type of uh, this is the type of information that we really need to figure out on, in, uh, on an institutional level and this actually will go in, it goes indirectly into the template that I have set up for that self-assessment what is it that we're doing that we're not satisfying and do we need to um, send out, I hate to call it a climate survey because it is not, but really um, our feel for what we need to improve within each office. Uh, we've done it, at, I've done it at other institutions. It is a non-punitive survey, folks. My office is not here to be a big brother's watching type of an office. What my office is tasked to do is to ensure that the institution moves forward on the objectives that we are being held accountable for, whether it's the accreditor, the institution, the strategic plan, the provost office and the president. So um, that's a very good point and, and I can tell you that it happens everywhere unless we begin to recognize that maybe our customer service skills are lacking and maybe we need to implement it. And again, that's not a definitive that they are, but do we need to be better astute to a path for each student? Uh, do we need to create a better path for each student that they can follow and again, not be in a position that they don't gain the answer to their question. Do we need to improve our website? Do we need to have information on hand that's somewhat scripted in, the, in, in each office, even in the college? Because some questions are very surface questions and we can answer them right away. And then some, like I said, will require a little bit more work on our end to maybe assist and satisfy within and gain the question yourself. And then do you take the onus of answering the student or should we ask the department to do it? Um, that they originally contacted. So these are, you know, they, they do require some thought and they're certainly not to be solved here. But I'll be sending out a survey to everybody. Um, you're not gonna get inundated by surveys, by the way, but I think it's necessary for me to understand what it is that we're doing really well and what we are doing that is perhaps in need of improvement. And it will be very important to understand it from a community standpoint. And I ask you not to gripe about things that are completely unsolvable. We know we have a parking issue, folks. We know that. So does everybody else. But we have made numerous attempts that have been very successful. And I know that because we shifted our class hours to accommodate our students who are coming in at a later time. I see Dr. Busquet nodding her head. I think I have that correctly because we put it into one of our responses to an accreditor. We shifted our class time so that when staff leave, parking becomes available for our, for our night students. So, so that we know about. But what are the things that you're finding to be difficult? And more importantly, what do you think that my office can do to better inform what the other offices are doing? And how, how do we rate that in, in, in a way that is, again, non-punitive and figure out a set of things that we need to tackle that we can then put forth to a larger body to ponder further and then figure out uh, the correct solution. It's not my job to solve these problems, it's my job to really delegate it out and form some very task-oriented committees who will be able to do that, this, where there's shared governance, all the offices that need to be involved are involved, and they will then again um, go ahead and tackle that with, with a lot of guidance from the community. But it would be, uh, it would be wonderful to have, an, to have answers that are very relevant and valid rather than you know, a complaint session via survey. So just keep that in mind, please, when I send that out. Anyone else? Yes. Would you mind stating your name? Because I don't know everybody, but I can hear you, and I'll repeat that question. Does this thing follow you? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs>
sorry, and do, are you part of an academic unit? I didn't hear because I was. Nice to meet you, it's a pleasure. No, and look, this is an open forum. Absolutely. And I can share, it. well, first of all, thanks for being so open and candid about um, your thoughts and uh, feelings about what we currently do and, and suggestions for improvements. Um, I want to say, though, that you bring up a very good point, and this is a point that's debated uh, in many, many institutions. I say customer service because this is an administrative unit geared um, uh, you know, template assessment and whatnot. However, I think that we do, and we do very well, make a distinction when, when people talk to our vendors and we talk about customer service and then when we talk to our students and we provide student service. So I, I think that is evident and I think that like you, people, faculty, employees who come to Kane, whether it's to teach or to work, do it because like you, they are passionate about the students I don't think we all do it for the money and to become the next Bill Gates, but we do it because we believe in the mission of the institution. And I think, I, I have found being here for a year and, and, and a little bit over a year that everyone is as passionate as you. And I will make a point of making sure that I correct the way that I speak about it, if it will um, make it a bit more student-centric. But I do think that we already make a distinction, and I really do refer to the vendors. I really think that there is a customer service aspect to our students, though, as well. And again, we can debate that, you know, uh, sure. Of course. And I agree, and you know, and your point is, is well heard, and, and it's, echoed by many faculty and by many administrators. So you're not the only one, and I really appreciate your being so candid. Oh, of course, of course. Anyone else? Okay. Folks, come on, don't be shy. There's seats open right here. Welcome. Okay, uh, optimizing data resources. You all know we have a number of platforms on our campus, whether they are academic platforms, whether they are administrative platforms, and of course we have Dr. Shen, who runs the wonderful Institutional Research Office, who provides us all with data that is a single stop, vetted, official institutional data. So what I'm referring to here is that assessment provides us the platform to optimize our ability to look at the um, item that we are critically examining, utilizing the three things that I just mentioned, the three areas that I just mentioned. So we have a platform in HR that will provide you with very critical um, info, for instance, and again, that's not for consumption of the faculty or the staff per se, but my office will, will can, can very easily look at very specific student data, very specific HR data, make some uh, recommendations. Again, I'm a researcher, so this is of interest to me. Um, and when we look at certain demographics of students or demographics of faculty, we have a very, um, a very nice initiative that the provost has introduced that looks at the promotion of students in the STEM uh, fields that we will be examining over the next year. We were accepted into the beta program. It is called a sea change. You're all welcome to look this up online. It's, it, is a, um, it is a program that rewards institutions who promote inclusivity, diversity, not only within its body of faculty, but also advancing our students who are uh, perhaps a little bit out of the typical uh, you know, private sector or, or, or a private college student. Again, we serve a very unique population of students here, so we are a very good candidate to participate in this initiative. And, there's a committee that was formed already. We had our meeting on Friday and we will be disseminating some important info to you and engaging the campus in garnering some um, good data from which we will form additional committees so that this is a truly a campus-wide effort because this particular initiative and, and the awards that result at the very end look at campus climate and, and campus inclusivity of these efforts and policies and procedures. So it's not a department that is promoting this. It is purely a campus-wide initiative, a university initiative, so more to come with that. But this is a perfect example of how we'll be optimizing our data resources because 
the committee, myself, will need to work with all the individuals that I just mentioned in order to, to be able to um, harvest that data set. And again, I encourage you to, to really look to the Office of Institutional Research um, and of course, the platforms that you have available in house, such as Chalk and Wire, Sedona and Business, um, Blackboard, to find ways that you may feel could um, enhance your efforts of looking at your goals and objectives, whether they're data driven or qu even qualitative. These platforms allow you to do that uh, via a number of ways. And, and my office can be consulted for this like I do for um, the academic programs. And it's a, it's a very lively and a very productive discussion most of the time. And of course, our last point, continuous quality improvement. We do this so that we improve. We don't do this to collect paper. So I promise you, um, with the beginning of this year, um, I will be looking at the academic and administrative reports and reviewing them and providing um, much more feedback than I have to date. Again, academic took precedence because we had some uh, important um, accreditations that we needed to meet, and, and again, it was uh, that was my uh, priority objective. So now the administrative side will begin to get much more feedback, and there will be numerous working out session opportunities during which I will be meeting with the individual unit champions that I just mentioned to you. Again, it will ease the process of me having to meet with the entire department, which I have done to date. These meetings happen, I just would like a more targeted effort so that it doesn't happen in a group setting, but rather similar to a faculty um, a situation. It's much easier to work with a single faculty member who understands their department than to work in a group session with all the units that fall under that, uh, I'm sorry, with all the subunits that fall within that unit and each may have very different questions. So this will lead to continuous improvement and again, of course, ease of um, report writing at the very tail end, which will be our middle states study. Okay, I think I covered all of these, so I, I don't wanna um, bore you and go through them again, but um, we, okay. Customer and employee satisfaction. So I'm going to take this out for now. <laughs> So please just focus on employee and student satisfaction. But again, we do have external stakeholders such as our board, such as our alumni, who are at that point consumers of our goods because they may return to our institution later on if they so choose from their corporate world to get a, um, an additional degree because they may very well be required to do so and see an opportunity to improve their career path. But. Um, Assessment forces you to really establish clear priorities and link to the, univers to the university priorities. Like I said, please take the time to read the, the plan, the strategic plan. It will inform your decisions and it will, and, and it will inform how you write this. Uh, I'm checking the time and it's um, a little bit at 9.50. So I wanna make sure I cover everything. Any questions? I know you can all skim through this. I want to just show you so that you understand how these two processes, academic and, in, and institutional, unit, administrative, whichever way you choose to call it, um, run concurrently. through a little bit um, so that you can understand the timeline. So as I had mentioned earlier, there are two facets of the report. There is the initial stage, which will um, ask for your objectives that you're evaluating, who will be the, the person in charge, the champion that I had just mentioned. It will likely be the individual that has been designated to be the lead in that particular unit for assessment matters, or he or she may very well choose to delegate that to another employee who will be charged with um, aggregating and coming up with the objectives of that particular plan for that unit. So we have two processes that run concurrently. We have the academic on your right hand side and then you have the administrative. Actually, there, yep, perfect. So there is, a, there, there is essentially um, three 
key dates that you should be aware of. There is the due date for your phase one, which asks you for the objectives, the individuals responsible, and the process by which you will uh, go about identifying and measuring the objectives that you had set forth. There is the end result, which is due on June, th that is due on December 15th. There is the end report, which is due on June 30th. And I'll share with you that after um, speaking to a number of administrative units, it became quite clear that June 30th does not work for everybody because of the fiscal year close and the inability to really look at data until after the year is done and a need for additional time. So what I have done, and I will go ahead and annotate that here publicly, they all know this, but I don't want to keep putting forth extensions and then not getting anything back. So the, the non-academic units are required to submit by July 15th, giving them three weeks of just about two and a half weeks of extra time to ensure that they are able to look at the data for the fiscal year that just closed and write up their report and draw conclusions. Again, qualitative and quantitative. Much of the conversation that a department like finance is having is not only centered on data outcomes, but is also centered on the qualitative discussions that they have interdepartmentally and of course with Mr. Brennan. Um, so that is due on July 15th. And then in case you don't know, that report doesn't just die in my office. That report then gets uh, sent to your vice president at the same time that it gets sent to me. And what they have to do is then provide a summary and a top level vice president's report by September 30th that then is put forward to the board and to the president and to the provost, for instance, on the academic side. So, so you are not just doing this to satisfy a need to submit a report to OAA. This is a critical document that all the VPs collect and then synthesize into a single report that drives the needs and the fiscal um, and, and, and perhaps fiscal needs, not only needs that they have assessed that are non-monetary and maybe just inter-office improvements, but fiscal requirements and fiscal needs that we have identified as part of the newly implemented section to that particular report. So it goes to the VP, their report is provided on, on, um, on September 30th, and then it, gets, uh, it, it, it goes through the UPC, which uh, then picks out items that are voted upon. I can share with you that much of the accreditation and assessment expenses, the provost and the associate provost have graciously allowed my office to handle on our end so that we don't take precedence over having issues like membership fees voted upon in, in the little time that UPC already gets to, for, for meetings. Um, so the large initiatives are the ones that are, uh, and of course large or small, I guess critical initiatives are the ones that we vote on. Am I correct, Dr. Busquet? Okay. So that then of course gets looked upon at the board meeting in December. So, so be cognizant that it isn't just a report that's departmental, it has multiple layers, multiple facets that then does make its way up to the board via the, the, the report of the VP or the dean or the academic side of the house. And as you can see, and I'll, and I'll send this around, um, and it is actually posted on the OAA website, these processes run concurrently, uh, exactly parallel, excuse me, to one another. So it, it, there's nothing that the academic side is doing that, that you are not doing and vice versa. The dates are really important because the moment you prolong submission, um, the, the VP report or the Dean's report cannot be done. It, it, you know, it, and the report that is not comprehensive is not a tool for us to use in order for plan, to plan more effectively. I just went over the dates and uh, I do wanna say that I put forth uh, two additions, budget request line items and professional development items. Again, I, 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 I realized that there was much conference and professional development travel that was going on um, in the academic areas or that was being proposed or considered by the faculty for their own research uh, and promotion needs as well as of course self-interest. And I felt that it was, you know, it would be a good practice to put that forth in the academic and administrative templates as opposed to just the academic one because I do feel that our staff on the administrative side of the house have opportunities to attend conferences that are very much division specific 
If they already don't attend them, they can put forth a need, outline that in their plan, and justify why this is necessary. And, and I can tell you that the VPs are very open to this because, again, they focused on the success, retention, and student success efforts. Um, what we will be doing, because it has not been done quite yet, is, is uh, conducting a comprehensive all-unit program review on the administrative side of the house. We have program reviews that are in effect for all of the academic units, and they're very much on schedule, and they are, um, and they're common best practice. So this is really something that's ingrained in the academic world. On the administrative side, I don't think so much, especially now that I have gone to the conference uh, for Middle States this past November, and about 60 institutions in the room that had this presentation echoed my sentiment that they're struggling with how to get buy-in and make sure that the administrative units focus on critically examining their current processes and procedures and, and of course, uh, craft improvements and, and plans that will be moving them forward. So that will begin in 2019, and I can tell you that I will be meeting again with the, with the representatives that the VPs have identified. I will, be, I will be putting forth working subgroups so that there is a concerted effort on the institutional side of making sure that this not only gets done, but it becomes a part of our culture, just like it has become part of the academic culture. Defining unit objectives. You know, why don't I go into the template right now and then I will actually, uh, I don't know what happened here. Okay. I will open the template and show you what this looks like as opposed to the, and I'm not quite certain that it will be legible. I do have copies printed, but um, if you can take a moment, OAA has its own website and on the very first landing page, you see there's Academic Assessment 2019, Program Assessment and Plan Report Template for the academic side of the house, Information for Program Assessment Coordinators, as I mentioned, that is a long-standing practice here, and they are actually being reviewed right now by the provost, myself, and Dr. Bousquet to figure out if they're the right individuals are in the right uh, position to carry on those activities and whether or not um, we can perhaps assist in moving those efforts forward even more. Um, and that decision and on who will be staffing those particular roles is forthcoming in the very near future. We will have a very similar system, as I had mentioned, on the administrative side. So you will find right under this information for academic program, uh, I'm sorry, for administrative program assessment coordinators. So if I can open the template and, and uh, very quickly show you what I, what I keep talking about. Um, Lots of pop-up messages. I hope I don't break this computer. Alrighty. So as you can see here, can, oh, that actually is much better than the uh, than the PDF document that was up. So what we see here is the entire template, and um, you see part one in red, due on December 15th, and then if I scroll down, part two, due on January. Uh, I'm sorry, on June 30th, 2018. And, and in this particular part two, these are the areas that I want to bring your attention to. Line G, professional development. Outline staff development needs, including detailed supporting data, rationale, and associated costs. And please be, and please sort of keep in mind that it isn't the cost, and I'll say the same thing for the budget line request items, and many of you have heard me say this many times. Please don't be hindered by the cost of something. If it's truly a critical need for your administrative unit, in order to carry forth the best service that you can provide to our students that will then benefit the institution. So the research the conferences, research what it is that we can provide to our staff as additional training, perhaps the student service training that we talked about, and the concise plan of communication that the, the faculty member was gracious enough to mention before. Um, these are all part of, for example, Noel Levitt's uh, student uh, student customer service training. I, uh, I'm adding, I know, I know. But um, regardless of what the terminology is that we use, I think the same theory applies behind the scenes. It is, out, it is Noel Levitt's way of looking at what it is that we currently do and how do we become better at, at putting forth the message that we want to our students and are there any strategies that we can, for example, implement 
within our offices that don't exist right now, such as a communication strategy or a, uh, or a pathway that um, I know Marsha has instituted even for the different students that are coming in for open houses. Do we need a chart like that for how to answer questions? So Noel Levitz is a fabulous provider of that type of training amongst many others. So they are expensive, but if we feel that this is a need in one unit, we may very well find once the VP collects all of your reports and I look at all of the reports comprehensively, that this is a need enough in as many units as you know, 5, 10, 15, that we may want to bring them, these people on campus and we, we may want to have them present a workshop. So don't be, um, don't be discouraged by cost, but really critically evaluate what it is that you need internally for, for your unit to be successful. And again, budget line request items, this can vary from a database that you may need to a, um, and I don't know, an office change. I don't want to suggest that at all because I know we have quite a number of moves that are happening on campus right now. But again, keep in mind cost is not the main driver. It's the need that you found through assessing your current office's operations that is driving this particular um, budgetary need. So if we go back to the template, what we are asking you to do, this is why I sort of stress the importance of understanding our strategic plan. We are asking you to examine the goals and objectives of each of your administrative units and aligning them with the strategic plan goals. So unit A has this particular objective and it touches or aligns with this particular uh, part of the strategic plan. It doesn't need to explicitly read that, you know, again, something like student enrollment. Perhaps no one will fathom that this is something that is linked to the financial side of the house, financial aid, but it is. Again, simple example, but there, there are more complicated questions that I can, I can uh, certainly answer. The alignment questions are the most difficult ones. Which goal do I align with? Don't focus as much on the goal. If, you, if we determine that you don't align with any goal, but it is something that is a unit-specific objective that needs to be accomplished, I can share with you that Karen Smith has come up with a number of those in her shop, simply because they were outside of the norms of our strategic plan or they didn't directly link to it, but they are very important in order to enhance the operations of that particular area. Um, and uh, I will be happy to share her as the new VP plan with you because it's very good and the objectives are um, quite well crafted. She's still finishing them uh, for final submission, but I will establish a way to sh for you to have uh, the ability again through that one individual that was noted because it's impossible to do it for campus-wide, to have access to the drive where all these are housed. We cut access because we were having a difficulty maintaining all of the people that it was shared with. So this approach will tailor the sharing to the unit via that one individual, and they'll be responsible for making sure that you understand it. But best practice is always my best approach to looking at how you can craft your institutional uh, goals and objectives, and if they are somewhat of an anomaly, her plan will be quite good for you to examine. So once you determine what the objective is and what the alignment is, you will determine the individual responsible, the measures that you will employ, and please make sure that it's not just a single measure. Normally, an objective will not only require you to have a r return rate of X percent that will grow over time, but also is there an underlying reason why you have been um, receiving a particular response with such a low percentage rate? And have you done something to uh, assess why? So perhaps a survey and a percentage of responses. Um, uh, to a particular, um, uh, you know, sorry, I totally just lost my track of, uh, I, I don't do well for talking for this much time <laughs> and the lights are <laughs> very, very warm, but you get the gist. If a single measure is not enough, usually there needs to be an accompanying measure to really justify what it is that you're trying to gauge at. And if you have not done the homework to understand why that particular objective is not working, that's when I will probably ap uh, pass the question back to you when you first submit the plan on December 30th and say, do you think this is sufficient? Is this at the end of the semester and at the end of the year give you the type of qualitative and quantitative data that you are looking to get in order to show a multi-year growth or even a single year growth? Keep in mind that when you come up with objectives, 
you want to make sure that you, you, you definitely examine all that are your unit objectives over a period of three to five years. You can designate if you would like to do two per year and one in year three, or if we go to a five-year cycle, currently we are on a three-year cycle, and I believe that that will be the consensus of the committees that I was talking about to remain on. So within three years, you are tasked to evaluate all these objectives. However, that doesn't mean that in year two, when you close the chapter on year one, the other objectives don't continue. You continuously assess year one, you just don't reflect on it at the level of detail that the plan calls for. So that in year four and five, when the program review document that you will be producing will come due, that will take into account your efforts of assessing and starting assessment and then continuing assessment for each of those over the course of three years. Year four is your self-assessment and writing of the actual program review and identifying things on how to correct and enhance processes and procedures if need be. And then year five will be the actual report submission, the back and forth between my office perhaps and the other uh, constituencies. But it's really important that you don't let the objectives from year one and year two slide because year three will be the last one with the least amount of data on. So please continue year one and two and fuse them into the template as prior year objectives and their assessment. Timeline and milestones. I am a very project oriented individual. So if I don't have a timeline for a particular project, I can tell you it will get lost. This is why you'll always find my office to be very deadline and timeline driven. So please be sure that when whomever the team is that you have designated as coming up with these particular objectives and working to garner data at the end of the, the given academic or fiscal year, that you have identified a timeline. So by October 15th, we would like X, Y, and Z. By, December, by November 20th, we would like to have part one finished and with collaborative exchange between OAA and for example your internal individual. So don't let the slide and on June and, and on I'm sorry on June 30th for us to determine that your objectives are not good. The measures unfortunately did not pan out because we didn't we never conversed about it. So be sure that you set up a very particular timeline that you follow. This will keep everybody on task. And then the implementation plan. Do you think that you already have these efforts in place and that you are continuing them and enhancing them as you, as you implement? Or is this a brand new initiative that you think you will need to have a multi-year approach to? This is the place to put that. You can, and, and this is a way to continue, for example, an initiative that you identify in year one, in year two and three and four and five. So it can be anywhere from a one-year objective to a three to five year objective. I would discourage anything over five because it becomes very difficult to predict how the higher ed market will behave and also of course institutionally we cannot forecast enrollment beyond five years very adequately to inform our efforts and, and uh, in our fiscal decision making processes. So I would cut that off at five years. I would encourage you to do three at the, the probably that's best practice. But if you feel that something is unattainable we can certainly discuss that. So this is part one, and this is what begins, uh, the work begins on that really. We are, I think most the administrative employees are 12 months, am I correct? Yeah, so we would start working on these goals and objectives right after the season for prior year closes. So I would say that you begin working after a small breather of a couple of weeks on August 1 with coming up with the objectives for the current year, which is uh, 1920. And then of course, by the time September rolls around and we have everybody in house, we have the faculty if need be for you to consult with them, come up with the plan and solidify it so that you can submit um, something very concrete on uh, December 15th. Now in June, or for you on July 15th, we then submit the data results, the actions taken based on the data collected, again, the professional development needs and budget line item requests. So this will be a summative report that you will provide reflective of what it is that you've done in the fall and then on the efforts that have continued in the spring. We're not only asking you to look at and examine data from the fall semester, we are asking you to look at fall and spring. So it's really a comprehensive academic year or for if I'm referring to the folks in 
the administrative units of the fiscal year. So this is the template. Any questions? No? Okay. Have any of you, um, can any of you share some of your experiences with maybe having some challenges in writing and identifying the objectives or maybe challenges with um, synthesizing the results at the very end. Is anyone not happy with the template? Is anyone um, looking to perhaps voice some changes that I can implement right away because I still have time to change part two? Okay, so we will leave it as is now and then we'll go ahead and, and again through this active um, communication approach via that individual that I mentioned earlier, we will go ahead and make sure that any changes that are needed will be noted early on. Um, now, again, folks, I can go over this in a separate workshop. I can go over it now, but I will um, make sure that, oh, sorry. So next presentation, I'll improve my ability to navigate a PowerPoint, I don't know. So again, the, the, the unit objectives that I'm asking you to consider, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. That is probably the most important item to focus on. And they're actually, there's a, a little acronym, they're called SMART objectives. It's applicable to academic and administrative units. This is very important because it sort of provides you with the guideline of how you come up with objectives that will stick. And I also encourage you to revisit the current unit goals objectives as we begin the process of looking in fall 2019, starting the program review, so that you are already coming to the table with some concrete feedback about, we had goals and objectives that read X, we cannot attain them, we have found over the course of time that we were assessing them that they're, they're essentially we, we cannot just move forward with this and they're not perhaps applicable to our unit, we would like to change them. Do not let the report be an example of accomplishments only. Please be very self-critical. I mean, I, I, I received reports that talk about objectives that were not attained, but they have a very good rationale of why. And that is not, again, a punitive message that you are sending down to the office of the provost of to your VP. It's informing their decision-making processes. So focus on not just successful efforts, but also efforts that have asked you to perhaps even reconsider an objective that you originally designated um, before submission of part one that you may have changed mid-cycle, and that's okay. And if in February you're telling me, look, this objective we thought was wonderful, but we have decided to change it, that's fine, as long as there's supporting evidence throughout the fall semester that you have thoroughly assessed it and came to the conclusion of this cannot be done it does not benefit my unit. It's, it's truly not beneficial overall in terms of time allocation. Okay. Direct and indirect measures, I'll let you read that through really quickly. Um, ideally, we would like you to consider both. This is why I said there are probably in order to uh, gain a true decision that will positively reflect your efforts of assessing a certain objective you want to look at both indirect and indirect measures. So consider that as you are crafting this particular plan. And closing the loop, when you write your summary report, summarize where the unit's information um, system is housed. What efforts are you putting forth to come up with the data that you are presenting? Again, data I'm terming very loosely, qualitative or quantitative. Define the process of analyzing this data. Define and describe how the results are used for decision making. And I actually put this in very recently for fiscal management. We are all very conscious of the resources and the lack of resources in, in, in nationwide in higher ed institutions. I mean, again, you know this. We have a very specific type of students that we service. So anything that we take away doesn't benefit them. So make sure that we become smart about how we, how we manage our departmental resources so that we do not take away, and I know the provost echoes this, that we do not take away the resources that we can be giving to our students. So if you can cut out the number of food 
serving meetings that you have and turn that around into an information session for the students with a hired speaker or someone that you may want to bring in order to have a s information session on something, think about that. Um, again, a very um, a loose example, but, but there are other areas where you can cut costs that I'm asking you to look at, not in a negative way, but reevaluate how we are spending our current resources and is there a better way to manage them. That's what good data, data analysis will do. Um, describe future initiatives resulting from assessment. As part of that failed initiative that you may have thought would have worked initially in the fall semester, you may have come up with a future initiative that still encompassed that original one. Describe that. That's the rationale that I'm talking about. Don't just drop it, but do provide a very succinct explanation of why. Define budget line requests according to um, priority, not cost. Again, I covered this already. And then should this objective be multi-year? We have not had this in the past, but I do ask you to again consider, um, and from experience I can tell you many schools do adapt this model because it is very difficult to accomplish something in one academic or fiscal year. And oftentimes the initiatives that, that we talk about and put in here are broad. So don't limit yourself and don't set yourself up for a situation that will require you to perhaps get discouraged from accomplishing this initiative. And that's it. So any feedback? Everyone just wants to go home. Actually, sorry, not home. Back to your next sessions. Okay, no questions? So we're done. Thank you so much for coming.